Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much for coming out on what's both a cold night and also state of origin night and all of those sorts of things that are taking us away from the main things in life or whatever. Um, my name is Roger Pryor. I'm one of the organising committee for the Newcastle Institute and uh, I'm responsible for some of those emails that probably clog up your inbox from time to time. If you're not getting those emails, well then it's easy enough to organise for that to happen. So just uh, do a bit of a Google search for Newcastle Institute and you'll find on the front page of the website when you get there down the right hand side, there are a number of call to action buttons, one of which is join our email list and that way you'll be kept updated about everything that's happening for the Newcastle Institute. Tonight is, a, I think, a wonderful opportunity to hear about some of the current trends and some of the possible future trends and the ways that schools are basically dealing with a very, very rapidly changing world. Often, if you watch morning television or listen to talkback or whatever else, everybody happens to be an expert on schooling because most of them spent some time there. We are now in 2018, nearly two decades into the 21st century, and yet we're still talking about what skills we need to develop for 21st century learners. So they're just some of the things that I think we'll probably pick up on as the evening goes on. If you have questions when we get to the end, then please ask those of our panel, and we're hoping to make this as interactive as possible. I'm not going to speak for too much longer, but I, before we go on, I did want to acknowledge that Tonight, we are sitting on the land of the Awabakal and Waramai people. The, the culture that both of those groups of people and in fact all of the indigenous people in Australia have goes back many, many thousands of years. And that this week in particular is a special one because it's NAIDOC week where there's a celebration of that culture and of the ongoing nature of the survival of that culture over that period of time. And part of that survival comes through learning which has potentially been done in a very different way, but no less importantly. It also acknowledges this particular NAIDOC week, the role that women elders have played in the development of Aboriginal communities and their transition over time, and the way that they've helped communities work through all of those issues. So I acknowledge both female and male elders of the past, elders of the present, and certainly acknowledge elders of the future and particularly the role that educators play in developing those elders of the future. And I think we'll probably hear little bits about that as we go along. But enough from me. Tonight we've got a final year student at the University of Newcastle in education doing her honours year, uh, ready to do an internship. She is going to attempt to corral our panel over here. She will introduce them to you, but I do know that sitting in this panel are some people who have got an excellent background in research and international knowledge about education, people who have been practitioners at all sorts of levels within our school system and who have runs on the board in terms of doing innovative and different things. So I'm looking forward to hearing from this. I hope you are and please, if you've got some questions at the end, let's make it as interactive as possible. Can I introduce Kira Campbell to take over? Thank you. All right, bear with me. I think that's still my height. Okay, so uh, we are told that an investment in a strong education system is paramount to a country's growth, productivity, global competitive advantage and social progress. Despite investment and policy reforms geared towards standardised national assessments and needs-based funding, our, oh, sorry, goodness me, uh, the performance of our education system in comparison to international data is declining. In an environment of rapid economic, social, technological and cultural changes, our education system seems not to be adapting to the current and future needs of our students and our society. As a 24-year-old education student, I am part of a generation that has experienced and witnessed assessment driving students' education. In my own experience, what can be assessed is prioritised, particularly when high stakes tests, for example, our HSE, are attached. 
I've been witness to cognition, which is students' ability to memorise, follow us instructions and apply logic, driving the traditional education paradigms of homogenisation and testing. And I've been witness to this focus as lack of consideration of individuals' passions, skill sets and desires to do things. However, as Einstein states, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. It was my decision, therefore, to join the movement of Australian and international educators striving to work toward preparing our students and schools for tomorrow. Australia spends 3.2% of its GDP on schools education. That's below the OECD average of 3.4% and well below the investment of Norway, Iceland, the UK, Finland, Sweden, France, Switzerland and the Netherlands in schooling. But that's an old world comparison with Europe. In Asia, we fall below Vietnam, South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong and Indonesia. And we're below New Zealand as well. In fact, Australia's expenditure is not evenly spread or distributed, either geographically or spatially. So what do we think about schools and their role in, the, in students' development? And what do we need to do today to help to prepare us better for tomorrow? Tonight, I look forward to hearing from experts in the field about what our current and future schools are capable of, what the role of school can be in building creative, healthy and passionate individuals, resilient communities and vibrant economies. To help to navigate this complex journey, we have four speakers, all with experience in the game. Our first speaker to open tonight's conversation is Professor John Fischetti. John is Professor and Head of School at the School of Education at the University of Newcastle. He's been working with schools around the Hunter, New South Wales and Australia for the last five years, reimagining learning and teaching for the innovation age. John has secondary teaching degree in the social sciences, years seven to 12, and he has teaching experience from the early years through to adult education. John believes that as, as they currently operate, schools as they currently operate need a major rethink and his work from the classroom to the boardroom uh, aims to make that happen. Prior to coming to Newcastle, John was Dean in the state of Louisiana to help professorships and held professorships in North Carolina and Kentucky in the United States. Please welcome Professor John Fischetti. for the kind introduction to the Newcastle Institute for setting up this forum and to all of you for coming along on this truly winter evening, right? We finally made it this winter. We'll be the summer soon enough. I also want to acknowledge that we're meeting tonight on the lands of the Iwabakal people and pay my respects to elders past and present and particularly to the future of indigenous culture and to all of Australia for getting your education right for every child. That's the obligation, I think, those of you who come with an education background, which means all of you, you've all been in school and done something, and for all of us helping to lead education, that we won't be satisfied until every child has a great life because they're really well prepared in education. We actually haven't made that commitment before recently to every child, and that's why we're here, I think. I also want to say my appreciation to the great leaders around, from uh, Paul to Joe to Tracy, and the others in the room. It's a wonderful partnership we have to try to rethink what we've done, keep what's really brilliant, and try to move us forward on the things we know we can continue to improve upon. I want to rock your world a little bit to start, if that's okay, if that's not a problem. Maybe they're doing it down, playing bingo or something <laughs> down below. But I think we've got a major issue on our hands, and that's that we're on the precipice of a major change in the entire reason we get kids up in the morning, stick a uniform on them, and say, go to a place called school. That the rationale that we've used in the past is obsolete, and the way we do most teaching and learning is, in fact, very old school. Not that it was a problem, not that it was wrong, but in the future, it actually won't suffice. So our journey to get where we need has to be to understand what actually has worked, the dilemma we have, and where we want to end up. And I'm going to explain this in two PowerPoint slides, not 20, 
in seven minutes, not 100, but look forward to your questions and our colleagues' interactions. So this precipice we're on the verge of, of uh, experiencing is between what I'll call old school and new school. I'm a 20th century learner. I just know, given the demographics of this room, most of you were as well, meaning your formal schooling was completed mostly in the 20th century. We're all learners for a lifetime, and not everyone fits that bill in the room, I realize. But I did my degrees. My PhD was finished in 1986. I don't know what that means. That seems like a long time ago. I, I did um, six years of full-time classroom teaching. I've been a school leader and a leader in higher education over the last 37 years. And in my final practicum to become a teacher, my university supervisor sat me down before the visit. That's a person that comes to visit you the final time to say you're all ticked off on the standards, you're good to go. And I had a very large six foot 10 African-American student in my class, the star center for our basketball team, the six foot 10 might have given away. I know that's old math, but that's still how I operate. And a wonderful kid, he worked till midnight at the peanut factory in Suffolk, Virginia, where I was teaching. East Coast US, you might have figured that out already. I was told that this guy kid, because he worked till midnight and I was teaching first block, that it was best to let him sleep during my lesson because we would all be at our, better off if he slept. John, let him sleep during your lesson. It'll be fine. He won't interrupt it because when he talked, everybody listened and it was like he could take over your class with one go. So I said, no, he'll be fine. I bring him a cup of water every morning before school starts. He's just here early because the bus drops him off and I'll, I'll give him a glass. Water's actually better than caffeine for stimulation. I know that all the cafes don't want me to say that, but a <laughs> cup of water gets you going just as well. I bring him a cup of water. He was fine to the lesson. He was great. Imagine if today our principal leaders here, those of you in schools that are here, your message to your teachers was, let them sleep. We can no longer afford to let a generation of young people sleep through their education, literally or figuratively. There is nothing to do in our society if you're undereducated or uneducated. The jobs that existed when some of us started in the, the workforce either don't exist or they will be automated. 50% of the current jobs in Australia will be automated in the next 20 years. And you know how many checkers there are at Woolies right now. Far fewer, and there will be none. A store opened in Hangzhou, China, just last year, that nobody works at. And they've replicated that in Melbourne, it's coming to Sydney, and it's coming to Merriweather. You go in with your app and your bag to put your groceries in, you leave and it's all off your account, because visual recognition software has determined what you've purchased, it's off your bill, and they just come in later and restock. And that's a human now, it will be a robot. Right? So under education is preparing you for nothing. And right now, we still allow about 30% of our young people in the West to leave school underprepared, to re-energize, be flexible and dynamic for the workplace. So old school, what was my PowerPoint? I just changed, let's see. Old school is primarily preparing people for marginal literacy and numeracy. We test that, and we test that often. We test that in years three, five, seven, and nine, and teachers measure it all day in the early years, particularly early childhood. That's fine, we still need to do that. Those skills aren't going away. But we have additional skills in new school, we'll call adaptive reasoning and critical thinking and creativity and problem solving and collaboration and open-mindedness, well-being, indigenous perspectives, cultural competence, global awareness, ethics. That's a good one for all of us in the fake news world we're in. And digital literacy, and that could go on and on. And most of us as teachers didn't sign up for that. I didn't read the fine print in my contract that said I'm doing all of that. But in addition to traditional literacy and numeracy, we've added on what some people call 21st century skills, but most of us in 2018 have moved so far past. These are what used to be the soft skills and now the hard skills for the future, and they involve dynamic, interpersonal, flexible, and engaged learners. And where schools in the past have been places that young people go to watch their teachers work, we now need dynamic learning centers rather than testing centers that kids engage to make and build and design and create and exhibit and present and perform, display, collaborate. The upper level of Bloom's taxonomy, for those of you in education, you probably had to know that from 1954, Benjamin Bloom and his team talked about higher levels of, of work. We primarily measured at the low end of knowledge and comprehension, not at this upper end of absolute 
cognitive capacity and engagement. So this left side is about compliance and passivity and rules. That's old school. There's still a little bit of that we need. Saying thank you is not a bad thing to learn. And understanding that there are rules of society, like stay left on the road if you're in certain countries and right on the others, all that kind of compliance is probably proper. But to be a passive observer of your own education in a sorting system that now picks the top 30% and says, leaves the rest of us to defend for ourselves, we can no longer as a society literally and figuratively afford for those children to be left over. And this notion that a gold ring for the top 30% leads them to a more prosperous future, Google doesn't even mind if you have a high school certificate right now to employ you. And they have a 98% retention rate in their staff, as you probably realize. So the world has been shaken and rattled and rolled by the expectations that have changed that we need you to be clever, we need you to be versatile, we need you to have a great ability to work together, we need you to be able to figure out some problems. And on the right side, this personalized notion of learning centers on the notion of passion and sparking the individual passion or passions that you develop, where real learning takes place, when we're alive cognitively with 100 million neurons we're born with, the 15,000 we add every day till we're three, and after that we cruise for the rest of our lives. Those of you who thought by the time you were 50 you couldn't tie your shoes, thank goodness that wasn't true. I was taught you stopped growing neural capacity by the time you were 17, well, you know what? You do it your whole life, and we can continue to learn and grow our cognitive capacity through our entire lives based on the passions. And then the, this notion that we have to really gain evidence of real learning, not just test scores that compare and sort. So if you think about this, teacher centered on one side, learner centered on another is the challenge. And just to finish off my introduction and warm up act here, let's see if I can not trip on the cords and get my little guy to come across. Thank you. If you're not convinced, and some of you are teachers in the room that I know are here because you're very open-minded, but even for some Akira's colleagues at the university right now, they don't buy any of this. And so what I'm telling folks is I can actually, if you really think old school is the only way to go, and it worked for you, it should work for everybody, tough it up, it's a tough dog-eat-dog -dog world, it's a sorting system, it's survival of the fittest, I can replace you for $39 US right now. And my little friend will help. Alexa, what time is it? It's 6.21 p.m. Oh, good. I think I have about a minute and a half left on time. All right, good. Alexa, what's the capital of Australia? Australia's capital city is Canberra. Excellent. Alexa, who's the Prime Minister of Great Britain? The United Kingdom's Prime Minister is Theresa May. That's iffy, isn't it? We, but as of right now, if you Google it, it's still Theresa. There, Boris is thinking otherwise. He's got plans. He's got the same hairstyle as Trump, which is maybe the reason he's, he's doing quite well. Alexa, what's the square root of 64? The square root of 64 is 8. All right, cool. So this is what I'm saying. If you believe that a teacher is the reciprocal of knowledge and the disseminator of information, the sage on the stage, and it's my classroom and it's my way or the highway, that I'll say is the left side. Old school. All right? Alexa? How do we get potable water to 300 million people in India? Sorry, I'm not sure. Oh, man. <laughs> do you realize that one of Australia's growth industries is in supporting, helping India accomplish its goals of actually getting electricity and water to 300 million people that tonight don't have it? And to help them move toward a generation that's well-educated? There's some coal burning fire, coal fire plants that we may have a dispute over whether that's a good idea. We're probably gonna help build them three of them. That'll make the hunter a little richer or poorer, depending on your values around all of that. But at least we can help them get water and electricity that might help them have a proper schooling and life. Alexa, how do we embed indigenous perspectives in all of the curriculum in Australia? Sorry, I don't know that. All right, I think my point may have been made, that if you believe that schooling is about information dissemination, taking tasks, getting wrong, right and wrong answers, guessing C if you don't know, and trying to get the gold ring of an ATAR and an HSC, which are obsolete constructs, designed that we only need 30% of us to be really keen in a world now that needs 100% of us, you're in an old school mode, and I'm sorry, you probably will want to follow me out to the car park and argue with me afterwards. If you really think schools are about getting kids so keen that they can be part of complex problem solving and really engaging problems, like how do we save the planet? 
then we're on to something special. It doesn't mean we don't need literacy. It doesn't mean we don't need numeracy. It doesn't mean we don't need the arts and maths and science and life. Yeah, we need all of it. But in the construct of the passions that help us drive young people to be so excited about their learning they can't help themselves. Because we have a whole generation of young people. The Grattan Institute says 40% of them right now, some of them are top students, who are mailing their schooling in and getting turned on when they go home. We have some examples of school leaders here who are doing some things different with that but we actually have 40% of our young people, some of them you know them, they've got a drone or they've got a music band or they're building and making things online, they're probably gaming this evening with people they don't even know all around the world, they're writing books and publishing all outside of school because they're turned off to school but they're turned on to learning. But this group and what we're about is thinking about how do we do that differently? And if I have upset you a little bit, then I've done my job. Thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you to Professor John Fischetti, uh, particularly for that focus on student passions. Uh, that's a particular area that I'm interested in, in my honours research this year in particular. Our next speaker today is Paul Tracy. Uh, Paul was principal in the Hunter Region Public Schools from 2005 to 2017. He led schools that excelled in the delivery of IT as a key source of learning outcomes, achieving outstanding results for Aboriginal students and being a leader in the implementation of successful boys' education strategies. He served on the executive of the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council for 10 years and is a life member of that association. He currently works as partnership manager for the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council. Please welcome Paul Tracy, everybody. fascinating to hear um, what you're supposed to have done. It sort of doesn't feel much like that over time because it's really interesting because the, the price of leadership for me most of the time has been stress, loneliness, fatigue and rejection. So please don't do that to me tonight. Just be nice. <laughs> um, unlike John, or well, like John, I've only got two slides and I'll probably go for less than seven minutes, but I just want to think a little bit about Carrying on from what John said, if we're going to do the things you need to do, what's the sort of curriculum, what are the sorts of things our teacher's going to need to, to do in a classroom to make those things happen for the kids that we need to make, make those future-focused learners that we want them to be? So obviously we need strategies that are good for future focus. And a bit like Alexa, what is easy to teach now is very easy to imitate. So remember, and. Professor Hempenstall is here tonight who taught me at university. We remember we had to learn the rivers of New South Wales and all those things, the rivers of Queensland, the mountains. Well, they look at them now in a virtual reality. They, they, they climb Kosciuszko. They, they raft their way down the Murray uh, to see how bad things are. So, I mean, we've just got to do things differently. And I guess, and it's a bit what John said, those really important soft skills of curiosity and critical thinking and problem solving are absolutely critical and most of the time you won't do that in isolation you have to do it with others teaching and learning for millennials they're a different type of person a wonderful person um, my grandkids and uh, are in that in that role but they need we make sure they need they're a, a group that need their learning demystified and they need to know why they are doing things and they quite rightly ask those things I want them to they need to know what it means for them, what it is that we're teaching them. It need, they need to know that their learning is authentic and it's going to have some form of real world value for them. And they need to have the chance to be successful. I'm not a fan of standardised testing. However, I'm not silly enough to say that there is no value. Because one thing, if it's standardised testing does not tell us everything, it does not tell us nothing, but it does tell us something. And there, there is our chance to personalise the learning for the students that we're going to have. And more and more and more teaching in schools is going to be personalised. And I can see that very much in the future. The days of the one-size-fits-all curriculum, as I often said, and stay down the back, you've probably heard me say this a thousand times, that the only thing year eight have got in common is they were probably born in the same year. That's the only thing. 
we're still in that way. Yep. Working with others, it's really critical that we make sure we give opportunities for that. And that's not going to happen if we sit in rows, we work in isolation. You need to interact with others to get meaning for, for your world. Learning occurs when you do stuff. It doesn't occur, I mean, deep learning occurs when you do stuff. 20% of learning also occurs through interaction and thinking. And I know it was much maligned, but the digital education revolution through the Rudd government was the most amazing thing that happened in schools because it brought <coughs> situations in classrooms and it changed the pedagogy in classrooms where, where students had to work together. One of the things that took a while to get through to people was that the technology was the teacher, the technology was the enabler, the pedagogy and what was around that was the important thing. And schools that adopted that are the schools where the kids are being really successful. One of the things I, I often did in my school was make my new teachers go down and see what was happening in kindergarten and our partner primary schools. Because if you saw what's happening there and then you look at what might be happening in the school, you, we're, we're um, de-skilling kids sometimes when they come to high school, what they've learned in primary school. Managing emotions, we have a, uh, the millennials sometimes need to learn more resilience. Failure is okay, and one of my mantras has always been that nothing interesting begins with knowing. So it's okay not to know. It's okay to get it wrong. That's fine, because you'll learn so many more things from that. And that sort of links, links a bit to, if you want to click the clicker for me, uh, to risk taking. And this is one of, one of the things where we have a, a school system that is very compliant. With tests now in, is it, we got one in kindergarten yet? We haven't got one yet? It's coming. So we've got three, five, seven, nine, then you've got the HSC after that. There's compliance things happening all the time. I don't want compliant teachers, I don't want compliant leaders, I don't want compliant principals, I want disruptive teachers, I want disruptive principals who will provide kids with thinking skills, allow them to go out there and find it is what's going to happen in this world that we don't know about yet. You might think it's interesting I've got the word play there. Uh, I had the great privilege of um, representing the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council on a tour to Finland. I got to speak there at the National Principals Conference. And one of the things that fascinated me about Finnish schools was the notion of play. So their school day consisted of an hour, an hour's tuition of some description, then half an hour's play, an hour's, an hour's tuition, then half an hour's play. And then, quite interestingly, was a, a half hour debrief on the sort of learning that I had during the day. And the more you think about play, the more, the more you see how important it is if we're looking about those soft skills that we've been talking about. Because play is really a, an evolu evolution solution to uncertainty. Because when you're playing, you don't know what the outcome's going to be, and I think that's a really important thing. But it also encourages a number of things. It encourages diversity. It opens up possibilities for a whole range of different ways you can do things within a game, so you're thinking better. It's generally cooperative, although sometimes when I see my grandson playing, co cooperation is not a wonderful thing that happens in that. But it also creates intrinsic motivation to be successful and to be the best you can be, and all those skills, that are those soft skills, I think are really important. And I would argue very strongly that play is more important than homework. Unless, of course, the homework is a flipped situation where the student is at home thinking about the learning that's occurred and what questions they can ask their teacher the next day about their learning. That is fantastic because I always hated the fact I had to do the 50, I always pick on maths teachers, the 50 maths equations when I could do the first one, I could do the last one. Why do I have to do the 48 in the middle? I always thought that was crazy. Uh, but anyway, that's what we did. Um, communication, working with others is going to be critical, <laughs> critical in, as, as the world goes on. Because we have a generation of kids that through social media, they're never alone. They've never known what it's like to be alone because they're connected 24-7 on some sort of device where they're, they're liking something or they're sharing something, all these sorts of things. I, 
I've got to be honest, and I feel really bad about this, but I, I, I'm not on Instagram. I am on Facebook, but I'm not on Instagram, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not on WhatsApp, but apparently it's pretty good, so I should get on it, and all those sort of things. But, but they're, they're people, they're, they're, their communication is different because they communicate differently. And I've, in my new role as a partnerships manager of the SPC, I've been talking to uh, the business people who think that the, 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 the group of principals they're dealing with are very different to the old model, that they don't want to go and stand at a booth and at a, at a conference. They don't want someone to come and visit in their office. They want to see things in other, other mediums. So we have to make sure we create those skills for kids in that, in that regard. It's very important that we have that ability to learn, unlearn and relearn. You think how different the world is from when you went to school. And yet, if Rip Van, Rip Van Winkle arrived, he probably would be walking to schools and think, yeah, walk in a place say this is a school. Because in some places, it hasn't changed a lot. But the world has changed heaps and we must make sure we, have, we give the kids the skills and the abilities and the confidence to go out to the world and be ready for what's happening. Who would have thought that drone technology would be taught, taught in schools three years ago? We wouldn't have thought that. Yet it's now, it's now being taught in schools, which is absolutely fantastic. It's really important that we encourage innovation. And the easiest way to cope with change is to create it. But that's not going to happen. That is not going to happen if we don't have leaders who are prepared and are comfortable with leading others into uncertainty. That's the fun part. If you know what the answer's gonna be, it's pretty boring. If we're not sure what's gonna happen, and encourage them, don't hold people back, give them their head, let them try it, let them fail. We want, us, we want leaders who'll see the qualities in others and use them. Classrooms now, kids are showing teachers all the time how to use technology, how to use things in different ways. Uh, and one of the things that I always thought was fascinating was we never, I was never asked once when a topic would start, do you know anything about it? And oftentimes kids know lots of things about amazing things and they can, they can be the facilitator of learning or the design of learning in that room for us. We need leaders who are adaptable because things are going to change and going to change rapidly. We need them to make difficult decisions. Forget about what the media says about the standards in Australian schools. It's the greatest load of crap. You come out and look at schools and see what kids are doing and it is absolutely amazing. The PISA tests, yeah, you know, I don't know. And we need to look to the future. We need leaders who look to the future and not to pass disparities and be frightened then to make that, that big jump to do things differently. You've got a wonderful panel here tonight, so I hope you'll, hope you'll listen to everything they've got to say and ask us really difficult questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, next up, we have Joe Gray. So Joe Gray is the principal at the Hunter Performing Arts School, uh, the only fully selected performing arts school in New South Wales. She was previously the principal at Singleton High School. Her leadership focuses strongly on teaching and learning and she still teaches senior music classes on timetable, not only as a passion, but also because of a strong belief that it is too easy for leaders to lose touch with their core business. Jo's career spans three decades of teaching, leading, being a professional musician, CD marker of HSE Music, HSE exam committee writing, and a passionate educator. Jo believes the future of education lies in removing barriers, extending opportunities for greater effectiveness of our teachers. Please welcome Jo Gray. Thank you, Kira. Could I just ask um, before I begin for a hand up if you are currently a teacher or have been a teacher in the past? Fantastic. Teachers never lose interest, I think, in education. This quote up here, an effective classroom teacher is critical to the future of young Australians. Research shows that teachers have the greatest in-school influence on student engagement and achievement. School leadership is second. Given that this is true, it makes sense that school leaders have or should have a focus on improving the effectiveness of teachers. 
Effective teachers improve student outcomes in whatever ways you want to describe them, whether it's external tests, attendance and retention, engagement and participation, job readiness, pathways to further education, etc. The schools that John and Paul are describing are already happening. They're not happening across the board, but our teachers do struggle and can struggle much as they want to be on this um, new way of learning because of some of the things I'm going to outline tonight. I have no doubt that teachers today are better trained, work harder, work longer, engage with more professional learning. They have a broader and deeper understanding of educational theory. They're more closely supervised, evaluated and monitored than ever before. And better teachers means better student outcomes. All of the research says so. Yet there is a perception that standards are falling and that our international ranking is slipping. We do know that teacher effectiveness is influenced by many factors. Obviously the quality of teacher training and their ongoing professional learning is critical. So too are one's personal qualities. Some teachers seem born to the profession and it truly is a vocation for them. A very important factor is the nature of the school community. Urban, rural, remote, socioeconomic status. And there are some very interesting stats I'll say very quickly here. 74% of Sydney's selected school students come from the top, top ICSIA quartile. In Sydney and Melbourne combined, 80% of students that attend selective schools come from non-English speaking backgrounds. And in the best performing school in the state, James Roos, 97% of students are from non-English speaking backgrounds. So the school community has a massive effect on how effective a teacher can be. School funding and resources are extremely important. The most precious resource of all is high quality teachers. All of these influences on teacher effectiveness, therefore student outcomes, are areas worthy of focus. However, the area I want to concentrate on this evening is the systemic impediments to teacher effectiveness. By this I mean the hindrances to teacher performance through bureaucratic impositions on teachers and those impediments that we in the schools place on teachers as our response to those impositions. The reason I want to concentrate on this particular area is because we should be able to do something about it. If you ask teachers and principals what will make them more effective, invariably they will say, let me do my job. Behind this response is a clear implication <coughs> that they are impeded in doing their job and as a consequence, their effectiveness is diminished. They point to a cluttered curriculum, the role of schools as a cure-all for social ills, accountability for student behaviour beyond the classroom and beyond school hours, duplication of administrative paperwork, data entry and so on, when they could be using that time in actions that make a difference, like preparing more engaging lessons, meaningfully differentiating the curriculum, looking at personalised learning, providing more helpful feedback to students. Letting teachers do their job is not having teachers work less, but rather having more of their available time spent on teaching and learning, applying what we know works and bringing it to the classroom, preparing and implementing great lessons, providing continual formative feedback. It's time and energy intensive, but it works. In Monday's Sydney Morning Herald, there was an article titled Teachers Drowning in Paperwork at the Expense of Teaching and they interviewed a representative from the Department of Education. That spokesperson said the department understood the concern about teacher workload and agreed they should be teaching, not spending time on administration. It said that the New South Wales Curriculum Review, which is currently underway, would focus on decluttering the curriculum so it's easier to understand and more workable for teachers, which sounds fantastic. However, last Thursday, Sydney Morning Herald had an article, New South Wales releases long-awaited sexual assault strategy. In that article, it stated, New South Wales curriculum will include content related to sexual violence as part of a long-awaited strategy. This is on top of road safety, sun safety, cyber safety. There are hundreds of other strategies that must be incorporated into school programs and teaching programs. The tops down deluge of policies, 
accountabilities and compliances raining down on schools requires that schools respond. And because the school leadership is accountable for everything that happens, within school systems are devised, on record, on paper, that will survive an audit, or heaven help us, an allegation of a dot point not being covered, or a learning adjustment not being implemented, or any of a thousand other things. We're okay as long as we've written it somewhere, and others have written that it's in their program. They've dated, they've done it, and they've evaluated it. An example from a school I know recently, some junior high school students were handed a four page assessment task and the teacher spent the whole period going through it with them with a highlighter because they couldn't make head nor tail of what it was asking them to do. Another example, to take an excursion now, requires such enormous paperwork and policy understanding that in some schools and some individual teachers, it's just become too hard and they don't bother. In most schools though, teachers recognise the importance of such experiences and spend hours on the associated paperwork and risk assessments so these students can have these experiences. Teachers here tonight will be able to cite many such examples. I know many teachers who actually use their own sick leave to take time to meet compliances. It's perhaps encouraging for those outside or that those outside our profession are coming to recognise the problem. And it's not just a problem for us, the stakes are high for all of society. Apparently, the teaching profession is not alone in what Ross Gittins called the latest management super fad of metrics, being used by big business and management where everything is measured and workers are urged on with key performance indicators. This model has inherent dangers. As reported last month, Victoria Police is investigating suggestions that thousands of random breath tests have been faked, with police complaining of being pressured to conduct unreasonable numbers of breath tests on a shift along with all of their other duties. I'm not suggesting that teachers are faking results, but I do know the external system is biased in rewarding seeming to be good at your job rather than being good or being good at your job. This is not a call for teachers to do less work or to strip away a whole swag of programs that do have social importance and for which society has few other institutional means of dealing. Instead, we need to recognise that the real cost of all these duties, many of which are indirectly linked to school education, the real cost is time foregone in quality teaching and learning, and it's a cost to teacher effectiveness, therefore student outcomes. I said earlier that we should be able to do something about it, and so we should. There are many ways, and I'll mention a few. Decluttering, what is really important. Streamlining, making things simple. It's like Paul was talking about the maths, and if you can do question one and the last question, should you have to do them all? It's the same for teacher training. We spend hours every year learning about anaphylaxis. Some people have very good memories if they're able to test themselves out and not spend another two hours every year after that doing the same test, it would be fabulous. We, we could change accountability focus from mountainous paper records to real observations of teaching and learning practice. Use existing hierarchical structures to do the above, i.e. the leaders and the experienced help to guide and not just judge, monitor and impose. We need to value teaching and learning and value teachers and learners. And finally, I'd like to quote Sir Kenneth Robinson, who says, you cannot improve education by alienating the profession that carries it out. Recognising that education can be encouraged from the top down is one thing, but it can only be improved from the ground up by the people who do the work. Thank you. So lucky last tonight we have Tracy Breeze. Tracy is a passionate and innovative educator who sometimes upsets the status yes. quo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy investigated and established the Cooks Hill Campus Newcastle High School utilising Big Pictures model of education. She was then appointed principal of Curry Curry High School in 2016 and the school has since been listed as finalist in the National Educator Awards for innovative practice and innovative spaces. 
Her work has been recognised nationally and her focus on student engagement is extremely relevant on the issues that we are discussing tonight. So everybody please welcome Tracy. Hi everyone, it's nice to see some faces that I know in the crowd. I don't know if you recognise me, but I'm the 1978 remote control. My dad used to send me up to turn the clicker on the television because at that point I predated technology and was the remote control. I found out today that originally these remote controls used ultrasonic tones and are now more likely to use infrared or Bluetooth. In 1950, this was created by Zenith Radio and in 1980, you could buy one of these machines for $190. The remote has now proliferated into our cars, fans, TVs, DVDs, or on an app. My dad's favourite saying at the moment is, surely there's an app for that. Did I learn this at school? No. I learned it in two and a half minutes this afternoon searching Google, which gave me images, a timeline, when it was created, how it was created, way more information than I ever needed. But what did I do with it? I shared it with you tonight and put it in context. Learning is no longer about the content. Learning is about how we use the content. And so when John spoke about the sage on the stage, that time in education is now certainly over. I want you to think about what is technology? Because so many people get caught up in what they believe technology to be. And the definition of technology is the methods, systems and devices which are the result of scientific knowledge being used for practical purposes. So I really wanted to talk about the methods and the systems that we can technologically advance in the way that we now move and shape the way that we teach and learn. I'm sure that all of us can think of things that help us in our technology. I drive now and listen to podcasts. I don't listen to the radio. I turned on my um, central air conditioning on an app this afternoon to make sure my house is warm for the 40 people there tonight for State of Origin. <laughs> and then I put on my podcast and, and drove up to Charlestown. I went with my son and I won't get you to pick him out in the image but I stood up at Apple today, and all of us have been to Apple. That's what it looks like. Um, Joe thought that I might have had some older people that I was teaching in my school. <laughs> Down this end, you can see all these lovely people who are like my mother, learning how to put her photos on her machine. Over the other side, you have all young people, tactilely learning, looking at the new MacBook, there are no rows where you walk in and buy your goods, and there's not even a cash register. There's no checkout. These people run around with these little phone things and they swipe your card and you're done, and you, they don't even give you a receipt, they just email it to you and off you go. So I was thinking of how does this look when we come back to what we do in our schools? I want you to stand up if you haven't touched your phone today. So why is it such a problem when children do? None of you see the eyes of a 15 year old student because you're not one in 2018. You were one where you didn't have a phone, you poor bugger. I don't know if you read Facebook, but you have to read. Like there is literacy in reading Facebook. And if you click on an article, some of them are quite long. You actually have to concentrate for four or five minutes. I'd like everyone to think of their playlist. Mr. Pondman, <laughs> what's the top song on your playlist, most played? Uh, it's okay. Mine at the moment is The Preachers. Every single one of you will have a different favourite song and a different playlist. Why don't we teach our children like that? If we have such an individualised thing that we can create right in front of us, and for so many of our kids, 
That phone is their best friend. When I first started teaching, it was the hat. One of my son's mates came over the other day and he went, oh, Teresa, I got in trouble at school last week. And I said, all right, tell me, Judah, why did you get in trouble? He said, because the teacher said, Judah, take your hat off. And he went, caps lock on. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. He got a referral. Anyway, not in my classroom. I would have given him Vivo points for that. All right, so I'm here to talk to you tonight about how is this stuff actually happening around us? I'm going to talk a little bit about my school and what we're doing at Curry. I'm also going to talk about what's happening at HSPA, what's happening at Merriweather, and what's happening at Cooks Hill, for those of you who don't know. So Big Picture Learning is a completely personalised and individualised way of learning. It puts at the centre the student, and its tagline is, in a community of learners. Learning in a community of learners, that students learn together, but they also learn alone. They create their own pathways through creating a question and developing a project, and some develop products inside those projects. One of the boys last year um, actually won the Young Newcastle Innovation Award for a long board that he designed. Um, another boy, you might have seen him in the newspaper, created the coffee cart at Merriweather and had to do a few things to actually sell that coffee because it wasn't quite compliant. But what it does is it allows students to follow their passions. And Darren Ponman and I worked really hard to set that school up. We still had to do some compliance stuff around Nessa and around things that happened. But quite honestly, I'm very happy living on the edge and seriously, has anyone been to check what they learn? Not a person. So I totally agree with Joe on all this compliance stuff, but when a kid said, I want to set up my own t-shirt company and did it and made money and went on to get a traineeship out of that work, then I said that is success. I think we've come too far the other way in what success looks like. I'm one of five children. I'm the only one who went to university and the four other siblings I have earn more money than me and I'm a principal in a high school. Just stop and think about that for a minute. Because we were always told that by going to university we would be better off. And it, that was the case in 1950 or 1960 or 1970 and when many people only had the choice of becoming a teacher or a nurse if they were a woman and then had to leave when they had a baby. So life has changed and moved on. So this big picture learning is a great pathway for kids who really just want to follow their own passion and they know where they're headed. And even if they don't know where they're headed, well, let's help them know where they're headed. But I tell you what it doesn't do. It doesn't allow a child to sit for six and a quarter hours turned off from their world, rolling their eyes, I call it withdrawing their mental labour, sitting in a chair. If you're quiet and you don't disrupt anybody, you can actually get through the whole day and do nothing. Nothing. So long as you're quiet and no one notices you and you're a bit of a wallflower. I've done it. I sat, I followed your eight for the day. Oh my God, I wanted to poke my eyes out with a pen at the end of it because it was the most boring thing. Everyone was spoken at for the whole day. They sat in a chair. Notice I didn't pick a day when sport was on. I didn't really want to play touch football out on the oval. I would have done it if I had to. But I, I did do that and I did it on purpose and I'm going to talk a little bit about that purpose. At Newcastle High, so Nathan Town is the principal at Newcastle and he was responsible for what we were doing at Cooks Hill Campus and he came up and had a look and he said, all right, how do I turn some of this learning into what's happening at Newcastle High? So he developed this thing called Passion Projects. And what happens is instead of doing an elective, students get to choose what they would like to learn for a term. And if you get the opportunity, because I'm guessing you all live pretty close, go to one of his exhibition nights and check out the exhibitions of learning. I went to the first one, it was absolutely amazing what the kids were able to produce. 
From that, um, Darren went to HSPA and I went off to Curry. And in the meantime, Darren developed a unit called Future Focus Learning, where students can, again, take one of their electives off and design and develop a project themselves. So that's sort of like a m m melding of the two ideas and, and putting things together to give students some choice over what they're learning. And I talk about students having more time, space, path and place in their learning. How do we start to individualise that? And how do we start to think about what skill set we would like them to leave with? And John touched on that with the learning skills. So then, what have I done at Curry High? So it, I went to Curry and I did a lot of investigating around this stuff. And I found that if you start something in year nine, kids are already disengaged, disenfranchised, cranky, bored. That's not the group to start something new with. So I decided to start with year seven because they don't know any different. So my year seven kids don't go to English class, maths class, science class, they don't learn like that. They learn in what we call hubs. And those hubs are 60 students with three teachers, where they break down into pods of 20 kids and then huddles where they're groups of three to six. They learn in station learning, they learn in parallel learning, they learn in master classes, they learn in and on digital media. So we bought Canvas, which is a learning management system. We had a 68% take up of bring your own device in the first year. And we totally shifted the way that the students learn. So they learn in Quest, which is their Hizzy and their English and their art. They learn in STEM, which is their science, technology and their maths. And they go out for LOAT, so they went French. This year I've introduced Aboriginal language and my students are learning the Wanarua language. Um, at Curry, so we have, we have three language groups in our area. We have the Wanarua, the Dark and Young, and the Awabikul. So you can see there, I've got a picture of three of the boys who are in a huddle and are designing and developing some work. They have a driving question that they have to answer, and the learning and the responsibility of that learning is put back onto the students. And we've developed a number of rubrics around collaboration, critical thinking, creativity and communication. And the students are driven by those things. We do a strengths analysis, a VIA strengths analysis, so the students are aware of all of their strengths, talking about what Paul said about resilience. We do a whole lot of work on mindfulness. The students are read to for 20 minutes every morning. It's the most beautiful thing in the world, being an English teacher. Just saying. Um, at the moment, they're reading Lion Boy and they've been reading Lockie Leonard. And you walk into the room and they just don't want it to stop. They're like, don't stop, don't stop. The idea is then they'll pick up their own books. They can either then choose to read on with the teacher or continue to be read to. And all the research says the more that a student is read to, the more that they will love it. And we're from a fairly low socioeconomic area where books are not part of a lot of our kids' lives. So giving them that exposure has been pretty amazing. Back to Joe's point though on teacher effectiveness. This stuff cannot happen without me giving time to my staff to learn how to co-teach, co-plan, co-deliver, co-assess. So I do give them time out of our RAM funding to be able to do that and have that time to learn together because our teachers are amazing people. To things that I'll end with. One of my hizzy teachers who wanted to stab me after the first five weeks of doing this, literally, came up to me about a term later and said, I am so glad that you pushed me out of my comfort zone because I am loving this. And she said, I actually don't want to go back and do the other stuff. One of my other teachers um, sent me an email last Friday when we finished up for the term. And she said, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be the kind of teacher that I've always wanted to be. 
So with comments like that from staff, we know that we're on the right track. It's not perfect, but as the quote says there, we're learning to be very comfortable in the uncomfortable. So this stuff is happening in our region. It's really, really exciting work. It's really, really hard work. It's very disruptive work. It pushes people definitely outside their comfort zones. But we're 17 years, 18 years into 21st century learning and we're the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you. Okay, so before moving on to questions, I just wanted to finish up and say a big thank you to our panel uh, for a really insightful and, if I do speak for myself, quite an inspiring uh, conversation tonight. So thank you very much again. Um, at this stage, Again, we will open up to some questions. I do have one here already from Trey, uh, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight. So I might open up with that question before calling on you as well. So Trey's question was that her son has been accepted at both a selective performing arts high school and a selective academic high school. I am concerned that if he attends a performance high school, this academic capability will not be extended as thoroughly as at a selective academic high school. Can you comment upon this? I think we have the perfect person <laughs> on the panel to answer this as well. Beautiful. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so Trey will be watching live streaming, I assume. Um, this would be the perfect opportunity for me to really big up my school, but I don't think that's what I'm here for. If your child is capable of um, being at an academically selective school or a performing arts high school, it very much comes down to passion and choice, I think. Um, they can certainly do extremely well academically at a performing arts high school. Um, performing arts high schools also have very, very high academic results in the high 90s frequently. Um, I wish my school captain was here because a few weeks ago we had a night um, for our new students and she got up, unbeknownst to us, um, just put into her little thing that she was saying some of you will be sitting here having been ex accepted to Hunter School of the Performing Arts and you'll be waiting to hear whether you've been accepted to Merriweather. She said, I was in that position when I was um, sitting here in Year 7 as a new student. She chose Hunter School of the Performing Arts and she has never regretted a single moment. Um, and the reason she gave for that, and it's a reason I would say to this question as well, is that that is her passion. And when you're following your passion, you are going to be engaged. And when you are in a school where everyone is following their passion, the learning culture and the learning environment is quite amazing. So that's how I would answer that question. Thanks, Kira. Great. Uh, I suppose at this point, I might ask you to perhaps be slightly compliant and raise some hands and we will call on you for some questions. Yeah? One second, we're coming to you with a microphone. Yeah, yeah, so just over here, thanks. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for all your wonderful um, speeches and um, giving us information. I just wanted to ask, if the um, focus is on um, individual individualising education and, and, and uh, developing passion, what's the role in selective schools? Why do we need them? <laughs> I'm happy to answer in the sense that, that uh, I don't think I've still got my teacher voice, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd go on and use it, yep. I would think that, again, some people might, might, might want to diversify and, and take things a lot further, which might possibly happen through being, a, being in a, a culture where, where a lot of people are similarly engaged and where the school might diversify to specialise in ver various areas. But I think, I also honestly believe that your local high school can, can be just as effective in that regard. And that's not knocking anything that 
the selective schools do. I spent, I helped set up Hunter, 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 Hunter Sports High School. So I know what it was like, so. Thanks, Paul. Can I just say, um, before I was at my current school, I've been in large comprehensive high schools and was passionately anti-selective, I would say. Um, I have changed my mind since being in the current school and one of the reasons I have is that the students there that share the passion are so intensely supportive of one another with their performances um, and I know recently there's been a lot of talk about whether we have selective schools or move away from them or not. Our students were aghast because they feel that they are in such a safe place where everybody understands them and everybody shares that same passion Therefore, they support each other when they're putting themselves out there and performing. Um, academically selective, I think there are similarities there, um, but I also absolutely see the value in going to your local comprehensives. So. Anyone else? Yep. I'll just add one thing and and say you know that I totally agree with um, both what Paul and Joe have said, and I've you know certainly in my job as an English teacher have tutored kids from James Roos and North Sydney boys and Sydney boys and all the rest of it over a number of years. But my, my question sometimes comes back to, who wouldn't want to be at their local school and be ducks? <laughs> yes. Just putting it out there, you get $1,000 from the university, you get every opportunity to go everywhere as one of the leaders in the school, you're often the school captain. That's right. And I, I would say you really have to weigh that up around what, what is it that you want out of that particular role. Um, our Ducks last year got an ATAR of 94.6. That fits in very beautifully at Merriweather and at Joe's school. Um, but she ended up Ducks at our school and she wouldn't have got that at Merriweather. Yeah, hands, yeah, we've got a hand just here. I think Hiri had first. Are we going to speak first? No. No? Okay, continue on. <laughs> I'm getting trouble on that one. Um, <laughs> thanks for the discussion about selective schools, but not being a teacher, one thing that concerns me is, and last night on television I saw, I'm not sure what show it was, uh, but there was a thing about autistic kids and there was an autistic kid who probably a high functioning autistic but nevertheless autistic uh, with obviously a mother with considerable resources and who's being taught to fly um, and you know, the adult with him said oh I only had to help him a little bit just as we were taking off and landing isn't that good well I think isn't that a metaphor for much as Sorry, this is not going well. <laughs> um, I, I, it strikes me that a lot of what we've been talking about tonight is only suitable for the upper echelon of students. And the big social challenge, as Paul Keating has said, what are we going to do with dumb blokes? How, how are we educating dumb blokes? Um, I'm at Curry High. I have over a million dollars in socioeconomic funding for my school. I have students, most of my students are in the bottom quartile for disadvantage and I have 42 special education students in my school and probably out of 860, another 140 who would qualify into you know, a number of, of areas of, of disability. So I think that the stuff that I'm certainly talking about is for every student. And if you go to Finland, there are no special schools. Every kid is in every classroom and is differentiated and catered for. They have selective schools? No, they do not. They don't have private schools either. One so it is one system and everybody is known, valued and cared for. So that's certainly the mantra of Mark Scott at the moment, um, as our Secretary of Education, that he would like every student to be known, cared for and valued. And I think if we're truly going to do that, then we truly have to resource our schools properly. And that means getting back the $13 million that we're missing out, out on next year. Yeah, let me take this just a slightly different direction because I really honor your question, but I want you to dis I want to disagree that this is for some elite that's predetermined. 
if each of us was going to be really bold tonight and we took off our shoes and socks and we lined up by our feet, we would probably in our imagination, first, first of all, most people don't like our feet, each other's feet or our own feet, but we would agree already that while the bone structure is similar and all the parts are all the same and we could label them, each of us in this room has different feet. Could we agree on that? We probably, we, I wear a size 12 American, 46 European, whatever system, that's a foot. My foot is a foot, which is pretty cool. It means I can measure things like the length of the room really easily and then I have to convert it to metric. But if all of our feet are different and we're all in agreement with that, what if I said all our brains are different? Not in terms of the chemistry, not in terms of the capacity, but in what sparks us, what ignites us, what, what our experiences are, what our DNA is, it's all a little bit different, like our feet are different. You might have a high arch or pronate, my big toe might be bigger than yours, my piggy toe might lean in and yours might lean out. But similarly for each kid, they're different. And in that difference is the strength. But our teaching to this point has been about students complying to the curriculum that was predetermined and to a syllabus based on that curriculum with very little choice early on. Later in high school, a little choice in the HSC, but not that much. And where we're talking about is designing the, uh, the negotiation through the syllabus in what works for each child. A whole different metaphor than compliance to a syllabus is the schools got to get ready for the child rather than the child getting ready for the school. Absolutely phenomenal change. And every child with almost infinite capacity, autism is not a deficit, it's a strength and schools have to adjust to it, particularly at the spectrum level you're talking about. Are we doing that now for every child? Not as well as we should. So in that, think about the difference between what a school looks like when it's designed to meet the needs of the child. And I use personalized rather than individualized only because an individualized schooling, I don't think makes it a school. Because everybody one-on-one -on -one is like a tutorial. A personalized means going both individual and collective in the strategies and pods and situation Tracy was just describing. So we're in large groups, we're in small groups, we're working our own, we're working online, in a personalized approach that means that my foot is different than yours. If I could give an example of how it's working in the foot industry, in London last month in the London Marathon, it was the first time in a major sporting event in the world that an athlete won an event in a shoe that was 3D printed for him or her. The shoe that won the Boston Marathon this year was printed for the actual configuration and folds of the foot of the Olympic athlete who's just an amazing Kenyan runner. Meaning we can design a shoe that's right for your foot. Right now, if you think you're buying 11 or six, you probably are a 5.8 or a 6.2, right? No one's ever decided you had, it was okay to have a foot that was in between. What if we got education right? Because all of us are in between year five and year seven and year six and year eight. All of us are always in an emerging state of knowledge. So our whole journey here, and we're not going to take a while to get there, because I'm not sure if we understand what I just said except about the foot part, is we're going to design education that's right for you. We're going to get it right for your grandchild. As opposed to them complying to the curriculum that exists, we're going to design it for them. They're still going to meet the syllabus standards, whatever society says, we're gonna do it in the way that works for them and we're gonna start with their passions and we're gonna bring it on in a collaborative way. Wow, so they have the same knowledge and skills at the end and so much more. And they also have a shoe that actually fits them. <laughs> Great, so we had a question just over here as well. Uh, my question refers to uh, emotions. Uh, to paraphrase, uh, co-counseling community, uh, there are two aspects to adult play. There is the acquisition and practice of new skills, and there is also a, a chance to discharge on distresses. So I would like uh, our panel to please uh, make some comment on the treatment of emotions and um, that aspect, whether it's counseling or other, um, in the school system as you're envisaging it. So we have a new wellbeing policy in our schools. Um, the three areas are connect, succeed and thrive. So one of the things that um, has happened in the last little while is the update to counselling in schools. So most high schools 
now qualifying for a fully qualified counsellor full time in their schools. I also employ a student support officer. I also have a young gentleman who works with my families in my school who comes in from Headspace. I have Catholic Care who come in twice a week to offer family counselling as well. Um, so we are really looking at that aspect of health and mental health as a key part. I said we do mindfulness every day with our students in um, stage four. We look to really encourage our students to have ways of finding moments of calm. Schools are very busy places. Um, we also encourage our staff to do that. We did yoga. Um, so we have morning yoga once a week for staff as well because their mental health is also a very, very significant part of the work that we do. So I, I do believe that, you know, that there's a couple of things in that too and that's a lot around teacher training. Lots of students come from trauma backgrounds and, you know, I say to my staff all the, all the time, no child in conflict can learn. So unless we work really hard around the elements of the conflict, then we can't help them. And sometimes that's just simply sitting with a child and sometimes it's saying things like, I love you and I'm not gonna stop fighting for you. And I've said that many, many times. I'm not giving up on you. And you can yell at me and you can scream at me, but I'm not giving up. And the change that you see when a kid screams at you and carries on, and then you come back the next day and go, let's start again, when you actually be the adult in that conversation. The change in those children is phenomenal and they will trust and love you forever. I see also the, uh, the international work around leaders' wellbeing is really critical because if your leader is not um, on top of their game, feeling good about themselves, feeling good about what they do, then you can rest assured that the place will fail. Excellent. Uh, so we had a question at the back. Yes, thank you very much for such a inspiring conversations from you. I mean, I, I was a teacher once upon a time, and um, even today if I go to lectures and things, even at university, and still we sit on our backsides and, and someone talks away for 40, 50 minutes and get five minutes for questions. I don't know how the younger teachers here, if there are any, too many, uh, how you were trained. I certainly was, you know, university and teachers college was mainly sitting down listening to someone. So where do you get the model? So, I mean, obviously they're always creative teachers and good people are. But uh, I would say a lot of people, they were brought up themselves in the city in the pews and so on, they're probably trying to do it, but uh, do we have enough going on at university, teachers, colleges? Uh, do we have enough younger teachers, even if they've trained the way you're going now, I don't get that impression quite as, as drastically as you're putting it to it. Um, so how, I mean, there'll always be creative teachers like yourself, but in the system, what will need to change if, uh, and I think you're right, what you're saying about learning, collaboration, working in groups, passion, all that. Um, how are you gonna move away from system that seems to predominate. Yeah, um, being a university student, I might perhaps take this question. Um, for my a university study so far, in every course that I have to take, collaborative learning is extremely important to us. Uh, in every single course that I complete, um, major coursework involves working with our peers. So we're already uh, really focusing on that idea of collaborative teaching and collaborative learning uh, in that respect and also the teaching strategies that uh, we use and employ as well so even on my latest uh, placement for example uh, my tertiary supervisor who came in to test or to I suppose check in on how my teaching was going uh, was all for encouraging uh, collaborative learning with the students and I suppose starting to disrupt that status quo to take risks I suppose is a big component of 
my background as a current university student. So uh, perhaps we do have ways to go, but I think that we've, we've come, we're really coming leaps and bounds. And um, in my own university experience, I think we're really on our way to um, taking that next step in innovation uh, with regards to collaborative learning in particular. Yeah, I just quickly before John obviously is going to answer this, if I learn how to turn this on, uh, it'd be handy. Uh, but one of the things that happened in the not too recent past, that one of the great things that schools did was de-skill our teachers when they came out. When they came out, and we lose a lot of teachers in their first five years in the job because they're not allowed to spread their wings and do the things we, that they're trained in and they're good at. They want to do. What has happened since? John came into Newcastle is a very different model and I'll let him talk about it. Thanks Paul. Your question is really spot on to the pedagogies that are used in tertiary education. We need to prepare people for that and if we're changing everything K-12 then are we really preparing? It's interesting to see how much has changed. There's still a long way to go. I'll just give two examples. You, well, maybe three. The, you already knew that the Newcastle Medical School is 50 years famous for starting with rounds like yeah. getting people going right away. So that's an example of an exception, perhaps. In engineering now, first year engineering students at the university, right away engaged in the community and internships and an active engineering practice, not in lectures. In education, this year our first year students, just behind Kira's class, we changed it after her class's feedback. There used to be one engagement in something other than lectures and boring assessment tasks uh, which was a volunteering service or a component, which is wonderful, called Teach Outreach. This year we have six for our first year students, being in each of their core courses. They're in schools and agencies and refugee centers. They're working together to solve problems where they're understanding developmental theory and learning theory. Uh, and we're doing some virtual reality components that the Secondary Principals Council of the region got to see. Joe got to see it, uh, Tracy got to see it at one of their meetings just a couple weeks ago, using simulated virtual reality technology and avatars to practice engagement with parents and practice lessons the same way pilots take off and land at every airport in the world in a simulator now before they do it with us on the plane. Do you realize your pilot on any flight you've taken has a hundred times gone up and down at that airport in a simulator in good weather, bad weather, and uh, negotiated that if they crashed, it wasn't with you on the plane. So we've emulated and simulated some of those components in our program. It's quite stunning in another institute, maybe in the future, we'll do a demo of that if you'd like, and we'll have you have fun arguing with a parent who's not very happy. Um, so anyway, I think you're right. Our pedagogies have been dull, boring, and old fashioned. It's gone a long way toward improvement. Uh, we're not saying lecturing is bad. What we're saying is only lecturing is bad, right? There's still a good place for a stimulating conversation that comes after hearing someone who's a compelling speaker. But when that's your only pedagogy, that's so 18th or 17th century. Uh, yes, just at the front here. So this should be the last question, I believe. Now, I had prepared this before I came tonight, and there's been a few hints along the way to other, to things that I might bring up. So what I had written was, with over 75 years involvement in the New South Wales public education, I'd like to congratulate the New South Wales Education Department for the wonderful improvements in special education over the last 20 years, and more recently, the introduction of more specialised teaching with autistic students. However, <laughs> I am very interested to know what is being and which and will be done, now you've answered a little bit of this along the way so far, with breaking the generational chain of non-parental support of their children's education from preschool, kindergarten and onwards, which I have ex uh, ex experienced re in recent times is still going on. And secondly, with classes in year seven, eight and nine, showing huge differences in levels of male and female maturity especially in English, maths and science. <laughs> I think what you're doing, what you're doing, Carrie. So I'm very impressed with the big picture. I, I've been on the periphery about the knowledge of the program uh, because my last 15 years of teaching was at Belmont High and for the last 20 years since I retired, 
I do volunteers at the Reading Literacy Program every week. And I remember you at Belmont High. I was yes. deputy at Belmont for <laughs> a number of years. Um, look, I can, I can answer to a couple of things in that. I really do believe that the way that we are differentiating learning for our students has made a massive difference. Um, I, I, I can tell you of a, a couple of things that our kids have done that have really shifted the way that they think about their learning. And that idea of maturity and that idea of gender, I think we, we have to be really cautious about what we do in that space because we already have a massive divide of the number of women moving into STEM related areas. Um, and I think the more exposure that we give to all students, the, the greater evidence set we're going to have for how we get them into those new jobs that are going to be, you know, we don't even know what those jobs are. So I, I can tell you that at latest count, America was losing 7,500 manufacturing jobs a day. So I think, I think we have to look more broader it is, to really it look is at happening that. though. Um, I'm, I'm involved with the, the, there's two schools in Armadale combining, Armadale High and Duval are combining. And one of the things they're doing there is the, the non necessarily linear progression for kids. So that the, so it won't necessarily be year seven kids with year seven kids, year eight kids with year eight kids. It'll be based around interests, abilities, and a whole lot of other factors. So the department is allowing those things to happen, and it is on the drawing board. Is it happening all over the place? No, it's not. But it is certainly in their thinking. I know part of the curriculum reviews is around about those things that that are using that non-linear linear progression. And let me give an example, if I could, of what I think represents the theme of tonight that the Newcastle Institute has brought to this forum. It's about partnership. Quite often we look at schools as the problem solvers rather than a partner in the community to help get children to where they need to be. And I'm gonna give one example. I won't name the school, it's in the Hunter Valley. And last year, three girls took chemistry. This year, 19. And this is a school in a place where you might not expect that transformation. How is that possible? when the double standard for women still exists, the low expectations in the math and sciences still seem to be prevalent in the media, in society, even in some teachers' expectations, perhaps as hard as we've tried, right? Even in some parents who say, oh dear, you don't need to go there. We know that the creativity and problem solving and skill set of women might even be greater than men, particularly in the early years in school. Men may catch up, but they're always behind the women. So in this case, how that happened was a partnership between the council, the school, the university, and the community to bring in women engineers and mathematicians and scientists from all around the Hunter to serve as mentors for young girls, to bring them to the university, to bring them into the community, to do internships, and to get excited about possibilities. And all of a sudden, three became 19. And in every school that could happen, the partnerships exist in the parents, they exist in colleagues like yourself who are around to mentor, and so it can be done. It's not gonna happen in schools as isolated silos, because schools have the limited resources they have, but in partnership with their communities. And those women now, taking the HSC in chemistry and moving forward, the sky's the limit in the STEM area, and in the math area, and the engineering area. So it's one example, it doesn't address the first part of your question, but I think with partnerships, of the community investing in seeing what we can do, the collective capacity of each in this room could turn three or four kids on tomorrow, even in school holidays, to their learning and to their schooling, we could do this. And if we can go from three to 19 in this particular school, every school has the chance to get every girl excited about their future, make STEM a real possibility. And even if it's not a STEM job, it's gotta be the mindset. Because each of us needs to be a participant in this world. We have very many ethical decisions to make in the next 20 years about whether it's proper to predetermine the gender of your baby, whether you wanna know when you're gonna die, or whether or not we do push buttons with North Korea or other places, or whether you elect leaders who are gonna take us forward or backward and build walls instead of bridges. We got all these choices to make, and it's gonna be through the decision-making that comes from having a STEM mindset, which actually teaches us how to solve problems. So I think it can't be schools alone, and we have some limited success, but we still got a long way to go, because I still know a lot of girls who by year seven have already turned themselves off to what their capacity could be, and we can do, do far more. We also could turn the internet off and some of the television off, that actually, actually misportrays, it creates violent images, and deconstructs women's values, 
and actually is what puts women as victims. Because I think, as you know, if you turn on Netflix tonight, you're lot to, likely to watch decapita decapitation, rape, and torture. And that would be one episode of one show that's very popular. So we have to take control of it ourselves. And it might start with your niece, your nephew, your grand, uh, grandchild, or your neighbor, helping them turn that button off the wireless and maybe spend an hour just talking about uh, expectations in life or taking a walk, even I with agree. a torch. All right, there you go. That's my sermon for tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Kira. I might, I might butt in at this yeah, stage please. because we've come to the end of the program. And one thing I know about a good Q and A session is that it actually leaves you with lots of unanswered questions that you go away and ponder and think about. I was thinking, though, Paul, about the question as you know, kids being quite willing to say, "Why do we have to do this?" And, and I mean, that's that's been going on since time immemorial. When someone tried to teach me differential calculus and. I couldn't ever imagine the time where I was going to need to calculate the area under a curve or whatever else. But when we talk about school, we talk about what we want kids to learn in them. And every kid should be experienced in this or, or should have exposure to that piece of literature or should learn that particular theory or whatever because the discipline of memorisation is good. They should know all the capitals of all the cities in the world and be able to rattle them off like that. John gave us an excellent example of what then happens when you try to ask exactly the same question to somebody who's been programmed to give that to you in a different situation. We could have seen Alexa, how do I get 12 boys and their coach out of a cave that's four kilometres underground? How do I do that? And I'm pretty sure Alexa would have said, look, I don't know. But had we asked questions like, who has the knowledge in the world to help in this investigation? We probably would have got some answers. What do we need to know about the potential diseases that people like this in a cave situation may have picked up? Who do we ask about that? Who has knowledge about that? <coughs> Who has knowledge about the capacity of people to actually distribute canisters of oxygen right throughout the passageway so that we can actually do that? In other words, once we have something that we passionately want to engage in and do and know about, it makes sense to ask Alexa. But the process of doing that and determining what the passionate objective is and working out how we're going to actually achieve it with others, with all of the differences that they have and the hairy bits of their feet and non-hairy bits and everything else, is part of what people are struggling with at the moment. And they're doing it in a legislative and a media environment which continues to vacillate and so teachers can be excused for not knowing what it is that people really want them to do. They just know that they'd like to do the best job that they can and that they'd like to feel good about doing that. I think we've had some great examples tonight and some good questions. Thank you very much for coming on to the Newcastle Institute. We've been going since 2004 and the objective has always been just to run monthly events that actually get people thinking and talking. So I hope that that's the outcome of this evening as well. Next month coming up, we're looking at the future of energy and particularly the future of energy security looking at some of the work that's being done in the CSIRO here in Newcastle and in the broader context of lots of the research that's happening at our local university and things around that whole concept and a very topical thing seeing as we're about to revisit the national debate over what we do in terms of having a national energy policy. So that's on next week. Uh, look, Kira, can I thank you very, very much for the job you've done, uh, wrangling, and I think for having a group of educators and finishing pretty much on time, we've done really, really well. <laughs> and can I thank Paul, Joe, John, and Tracy as well for their time. Thank you.